Right, thank you. Oh, yep, this is on. Good. So, uh, I'm Andy Davies. I work for a Finnish financial company, um, but I am English, so I work out in Finland. And I'm going to talk about feature toggles and not only what's good about them, but some of the hilariously bad stories that have happened with them. And because horror stories are, are the best stories, we're going to start with the horror stories. So who here has heard of Night Capital? Just a show of hands. Like five people? That's about right. And if you want to shout out, why have you heard of them? Yes, the answer was they lost a bunch of money. And, and that's, that's putting it lightly. So for those who don't know who they are, um, they're an American, they were an American company, <laughs> um, who were doing global financial services, doing market making, I have no idea what that is, market trading, and I think that's what caused the uh, credit crash, and hi basically high frequency traders. Now, they had a slight hiccup involving feature toggles and some deployments. So on the day in question for this, they had around $365 million in assets available to them. This is their share price on that day. And you can see there's quite a large drop. Now that looks like it happens over the course of a day, but it actually happens over the course of 45 minutes. And it's a logarithmic scale, so in fact that's an even bigger drop than it looks. So the question is what they actually did to cause this drop. And it comes down to two features that they had. The first one is an older feature called PowerPeg. Now this would count the number of shares in an order and then split it up into smaller orders and execute fulfillments against that. Now this code had been in their code base for around eight years but had not been used in about eight years. And it was behind a feature flag. They then wrote a new version of code called SMARS, which did something similar but grouping the orders rather than turning them into individuals. And SMARS was designed to replace PowerPeg. But rather than creating a new feature toggle for it and removing the old one, they decided to reuse the toggle. But being smart, they tested it, so when these diagrams, uh, light green is going to mean the feature flag is active, dark green will be a deployed version but without active, and blue is the old version. So they deployed it to QA, activated the feature flag, tested their new system, and it worked. So they promoted it into production. This is their first problem. They had eight production servers, but one of them didn't get the deployment, and they didn't notice because their deployment thing was not great. They then switched on the feature flag. <coughs> Seven of the servers started doing the new SMARS code, which was fine. One of the servers started doing the PowerPeg code. Now, PowerPeg, when it ran, would split the order and count the orders until it had fulfilled the original order. The trouble was the piece of code that did the counting had been moved earlier in the process. So PowerPeg could no longer actually count, but it could still split orders. And as this is high frequency trading, it started inf executing an infinite number of orders as fast as it possibly could. Because you know, if you can't count and you've said like, fulfill 10 orders, it's gonna send out, keep sending out more and more and more orders until it gets to 10, but it can't count, so it just keeps going forever. Now within about 10 minutes, someone noticed this. And they did the logical thing, if you're not running on feature toggles. They rolled back to the previous version of the code. So now rather than one server executing an infinite number of orders infinitely quickly, you've now got eight servers doing it. Which turns out is a bit worse. <coughs> After another few minutes, someone noticed that things were still going really wrong, and they switched off the feature flag. Now, this whole process took 45 minutes. And they had $365 million to start with, and this 45 minutes costs them $450 million, which puts them quite far into the negative. Hence why they were an American company, because they don't exist anymore. So given that this is what could happen if you messed up a each toggle, we've got some lessons that we can come from this. I mean, the first one is 
actually have a deployment process that tells you if the deployment failed. But the first main lesson is never reuse a feature toggle. If they just used a new toggle for the SMARS code and then left the toggle for the power pack, this wouldn't have happened because they'd have switched on the new flag and seven servers would have started doing the new code and the old server wouldn't know what to do with the flag so would have just continued doing the old thing. Hopefully, someone would have noticed that it wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing, but at least it wouldn't have been executing an infinite number of orders. The second point comes along is the dead code. If you haven't used a feature in eight years, why is it still in your code base? Just, just delete it. I mean, if you really need it back, you can get it from source control. Especially as this particular case proved that their eight-year-old code didn't work anyway. I mean, the code itself hadn't changed, but the assumptions it relied on had changed. So not only should you not have it there, but if your feature toggles obey the next rule of having a really short lifetime, then you're not going to have this problem anyway. Ideally, a feature toggle should only live for maybe a day, a couple of days, maybe a few months if you're doing a really slow phase rollout. We'll cover those in a while. But it also indicates that they had another problem. What do you name a feature flag? If it was called Enable Power Peg or SMARS Active, that would have made sense because you could have seen what it was going to do. But I mean, I would imagine it was just called Enable Fancy Trading Thing. And someone was like, oh, that's the new feature, switch it on. But it might have been the old feature. The other thing that you might end up doing is having like a, a Jira ticket number as a feature flag, which, fine, it's going to tie it to a specific ticket, but it's not very descriptive. You're going to need to look up what that ticket is at some point. So please include the name of your flag. Actually make them meaningful. And don't reuse them. So yeah, lesson three, name your toggles well. Now, feature toggles in general are useful because they provide flexibility except if you do this. And you can have feature toggles at different phases of your application. You can compile them on startup, or sorry, you can compile them, run them on startup, check them periodically, or do activity checking. Activity checking, in fact, uses the, the periodic one in the background because you don't want to incur the latency cost of going to your featuring service and constantly checking every time someone reloads a page, for instance. You probably shouldn't be using compile time toggles. There's not very many times where that's a useful way of doing a toggle. About the only place that I found it useful is um, if you've got a particularly invasive SQL profiler or something and you wrap that in a if debug flag and that only needs to be on your machine. But if you have a feature flag that's compile time based and now you need to change it in production, you've got to recompile your application. And if that's not a quick thing to do, you can't change it quickly if you've discovered that you're spending a lot of money very quickly. Now, I don't know what kind of flag that uh, uh, Knight Capital were using, but I would imagine it was the periodic one because they were able to switch it off at some point, just not quick enough. But now that we've seen that what can go horrifically wrong with a feature flag, there are some good stories. So who's heard of an, a small company called HP? Okay, that's basically everyone. So in, in this case, we're going to be talking about Hewlett Packard's printer division. And I think it's the, I can't remember what the name of the firmware division is, Future Smart, I think. Now, they had a single monolithic code base that dealt with all of the uh, firmware code for all printers and scanners and copiers and all of the other kind of stuff. And they were having a problem in that they couldn't deliver software very quickly. They had around 800 developers worldwide and about 10 million lines of code. And they were managing two releases per year, which, you know, is not very quick. Uh, when they analyzed what their developers were doing, it turned out that they were only spending 5% of their time working on new features. 25% of the time was merging between branches and Another 15% was writing plans of what they were going to do in a year's time, which would then have to be rewritten in the next six months when it was wrong because they hadn't done more than 5% development time. You know, one of those uh, infinite... Uh, sip. 
vicious circles, that was it, a vicious circle of feedback. The other problem they had is that when they did a build and a committed code and pushed it off, it took around eight weeks to get feedback on whether that code that you'd written had worked. Now, if you, you can't say you're practicing continuous integration if it takes eight weeks to do your integration part. It's continuous, but not in a way that's useful. And the problem comes with this is you commit it onto a branch and then hope the build works. In an eight weeks time, someone comes along and says, hey, you broke the build. And you're like, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. And they're like, you, you wrote some code that did this. Uh, I've not worked here that long, you know. And the reason they were spending so long with their branching is because this was their branching strategy. There is a, a book and a, a long blog post that explains this far more in depth, which I'll give some link to at the end. So basically, they would create a branch for a printer edition. They'd make configuration changes and bug fixes. In this case, the red diamonds are bug fixes. Now, they were using compile time toggles for all of this. And all of their configuration changes was effectively going through the code base and going, if printer model equals X, then enable, I don't know, double-sided printing. If printer model equals Y or Z, then enable the scanning attachment everywhere. And then occasionally they'd have a bug fix and a new printer model. And of course, the bug fixes need to be in all versions of the code base. So you end up with that for merging. And I, 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 I struggle to see how they only manage 25% time doing merging. And each one of these branches would trigger a separate release and a separate build process. And each one of those took eight weeks. And then if you made a bug fix and it took eight weeks to find your bug fix didn't work, it already merged into other branches and now you've broken other branches. You know, not very good. So what they did to fix this is switch to trunk-based development and startup feature flags. So they had one branch, which by the way is the way you should be developing. Trunk-based development is the way forward. Small if branches would add new configurations for printers and small bug fixes. Slightly longer for lib branches were for double-sided printing, for instance, add a new feature to the code base. Part of that double-siding branch might be to add a new entry into all the config files to say these are the printers that support it. On startup, the printer would load the firmware, pass in what its model number was, and the firmware would read the right config file. <coughs> now, their switch of doing this meant that they went from eight week feedback cycle to two days, which included integration testing on real printers. And if I had to have tests run on real printers, then a two day window is fine. They got feedback for whether it passed unit tests and such much quicker. Two days meant that, you know, it actually worked on hardware. Now, this is the rule from that comes out of this, is that your architecture matters. By re-architecting how they'd got their code base structured to work for startup feature toggles rather than compile time, gave them a lot more flexibility. And it meant that they could provide more business value faster because before this, when the business came with their 200 ideas, they'd look at this list and say, hey, sorry, you need to pick any two that might get done in the next year. And now they can iterate quickly and add new features and test things out. You've also got less editions of the firmware to, to actually check because you've only got one build that supports everything. And even though this is called continuous delivery, it doesn't mean they were releasing firmware every day. They could release it every day if they wanted to, but normally they drop a new version of the firmware every month. So you are always ready to deploy with this but doesn't mean you have to deploy. When we're looking at the architecture of things, one of the developers I worked with when we first spoke about feature toggles, this was his reaction. I do not want this throughout the code base, all over the place. If toggle is enabled, do this. If it's no better than having an if divine. And he's right, you shouldn't have that throughout the code base because just because you're using feature toggles doesn't mean give you an excuse to write bad code. Your architecture really does matter. We can get round this by using branch by abstraction. If you're doing trunk based development, you'll probably be doing branch by abstraction anyway. Essentially, 
Now this is an example from a previous company that I worked at. We have an email connector interface. Um, I don't know if you're .NET or C Sharp or, or Java developers, but this should be fairly understandable. I hope. Single method for dispatching an email message. And we have two implementations of it. One connects to a web service and one connects to RabbitMQ. The actual implementations don't really matter for the purpose of this. Now on startup, we have a dependency injection container which reads the state of the toggle and either registers the RabbitMQ connector or the web service connector. There's one place in the code base that this toggle is checked and that's in startup. This means that you don't have to try and go through your co whole code base finding every place that the email connection is type is checked. It's only in one place. If you want to remove it, just delete two of the lines. Or three, depending which one you delete. Yeah. I can't count. If you need more dynamicness for your toggle, then you can use a decorator or, or a factory or anything like that. And again, we just limit the checking of the toggle to one place in the code. Every time we call dispatch, this will look up whether the email queue is enabled and either use one or the other. Now, while this is fine for backend stuff, a lot of questions seem to come up over, this is great, but this won't work on the front end of my application. You can't say if a button, should I show? But you can. So if you're using something like uh, React.js, you might have a button called this one click buy button. And you can't tell from this code whether all the buttons are going to show up or not. Because internally, the one click buy is checking the state of a feature toggle. It's this wrap line at the bottom. If you use React similar to how um, the Redux meta middleware wraps all components. And in this case, we've limited our should we show this one click buy button to one place at the bottom of this file, which is great because if you've just written this, you'll probably have to switch it off because Amazon will probably sue you for doing it because they have a patent on it. So yeah, we can hide things and do single responsibility on the front end as well. By the way, don't try and find this React toggles package. It doesn't exist. I made it up for this slide. If you want to write it, go for it. I give you permission. Now, we've seen a couple of types of toggles. We should probably look at what the actual different usages of them are. And especially as the operations toggle is the, the, bit of the special case. Now, the release toggles, this is the ones that we've been mostly talking about. It's where you're releasing a new feature and you might want to do a phase rollout or switch it on later. So Facebook, for instance, is known for having most features that you'll see have been in production for six months. It's just that you've not seen them because they're hidden. Then they switch them on and you suddenly get a new feature, but it's also back populated with data and they already know it works. So a release toggle. Oh, that was weird. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so that's the release toggle. The experiment toggle similar to release but you tend to also wrap it up with some metrics so you'll do an a b test like should my buy now button be green or red add some metrics to both cases and then for 10 percent of your users show them the new color button see if that gives you a higher click-through rate so experiments tend to be short-lived operations toggles are a bit of a special case these are the only toggles that might end up being long-lived you want to be able to switch on and off some feature based on performance. Maybe you've got an expensive process that runs in the background and you'd want to switch it off sometimes. Finally, the other kind of toggle we get is permission toggles. So if a user is a member of a certain group, hide or show a feature. And my advice on permission toggles is don't. That's not what feature toggles are for. This is what authorization and authentication is for. So if you're on .NET platform, you're probably looking at something like Identity Server, or on the Java platform, probably Key Cloak or something similar. So you can achieve it with feature toggles, but you're kind of misusing what they're for. You should be using a different thing. There's 
it's, it, there's a similarity. And if you're in a pinch and you need to add a permissioning flag, do it, but refactor it for as quickly as you can. Because by definition, a feature, uh, permission toggle is going to live for a long time. And you don't want long-lived feature toggles. So don't. Hence why it's no longer on the slides. So a release toggle, because of how you're doing the rollout, you might use a compile time toggle. Again, probably not a great idea, but you can. Otherwise, you might use a startup toggle. So if you're doing microservices, then you might have a flag given to your, to your service in startup. And then when you want to change the value of the flag, you just change the value and restart the service. Assuming you're behind a load balancer or something, you can just do that for each one of your, your, flag, uh, of your uh, containers. The periodic version, maybe it checks every five minutes to see if the flag's changed. You could go to activity level, but generally if you're doing a phase rollout or something, you don't need that quicker reaction time. That's generally when you're doing experiments. An experiment, you tend to want to be slightly more responsive than your releases, especially if you've got a risky experiment. Basically, the more risky an experiment is, the further to the right-hand side of this image you should be. Because if your experiment's really risky and you've decided that it's really not working and it's having a massively negative impact, being able to switch it off very quickly is a good idea. If you'd done it with a compile time toggle, you'd have to rebuild the application and then deploy it and then wait for the deployment to happen, and by which point you might have lost $450 million. Which, you know, is probably not a good idea. So yeah, more risk, more checking, little risk, less checking. Finally, we have the operations toggles. Now, these are the only ones that I feel should be allowed to live for longer than a couple of weeks. They don't affect small groups of users. It tends to switch on or off something for an entire system. Now, at a previous company, we had uh, a very large background process that caused a humongous amount of load on the SQL Server. We knew ways to fix it. Essentially, we needed to replace it with Elasticsearch. But we had other things on our plate as well, and it wasn't that high priority. So what we did is we had a performance monitor, which could toggle the state of an operations toggle, and the operations toggle would switch off the background process. And we could have it off for maybe two hours before someone would notice. Now, because we didn't want to invest a lot of time in it, our highly automated performance monitor, which is like the most cutting edge computer you can possibly imagine, it's called a person, uh, the DBA. And he, when he was looking at the DBA database, if he saw the performance went up too high, he'd just switch off the background service. And then hopefully remember to switch it back on again. Not that he ever forgot, ever. Now, we also put metrics onto this because while we are allowed to have the background process off for a while, and we can have it off for about two hours before people notice, if you had this automated and the toggle was switching on and off really quickly, maybe it's only off or on for five or 10 minutes at a time, and then it goes off again for five minutes and back on again. The background process is never actually going to complete anything because it's being killed off too quickly. So you'd need monitoring on this to make sure that your, your toggle's not flapping too much or you've got the right threshold for switching on and off. Eventually, we didn't actually automate the, the, uh, the performance monitor because we got to the point where we were able to replace this with Elasticsearch. And then this whole uh, workaround was no longer needed. So we just deleted it. And everyone loves deleting code. <coughs> so our lesson from that is that you should definitely monitor toggles. Not only because to save the flappiness of a toggle, but also if you're using a feature toggle or even an experiment, how do you know when your feature is completely rolled out? Essentially, there's two graphs you care about. The first one is how much your toggle is queried, and the second one is how much it's queried as being on. With this one, uh, on the left, you can see a phase rollout happening. So this is where we are rolling out new containers, and you can see that more containers are querying this toggle until they're all querying it. And then suddenly it drops off, and that drop off is us deleting the toggle. 
either because the experimental rollout was successful and we no longer need the toggle, or because the rollout or experiment was a failure and we just delete the failing code. If it's an experiment, it's probably only a small amount of code anyway, so you're not losing that much. The rollout graph is used so that we can tell what, how much of our user base is actually seeing the new feature. So we'll go through an example in a minute, and the rollout for it took a month, maybe, maybe longer, because we had to be very careful about what we were doing. It was kind of an experiment and a rollout at the same time. Once we can see that we're hitting, say, 100% of queries coming through, after a while, we can delete the toggle, because if everyone's seeing it as on all the time, it doesn't need to be there. You can replace it with the word true in your statement, or just delete everything. I like deleting code. I managed to delete two million lines the other week. That was great. One commit. And no functionality was lost in the process. Anyway, so this goes back to our email connector that we saw earlier. And this is how we did a phase rollout of it. So our old system, we had a desktop application with about 500 users. And for various reasons, the desktop application was not allowed to talk to Exchange directly to send emails. It had to come from a server. So someone wrote a SOAP service that took connections from the application in XML, transformed the XML into a mail message, and then sent it to Exchange to send. Now, this SOAP service also did other kinds of magic to the email as well. It was doing far more than just relaying. And it wasn't, it didn't have a single unit test for it or anything. It was lovely. And it fell over all the time. And Exchange was dodgy for reasons. I mean, it took 800 milliseconds to send one email, which feels slow to me. But also, for a period of 15 minutes, every day, it would take 30 seconds to send one email. We never got to the bottom of why, but when we looked at the, 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 mo the metrics dashboard, you could see the spike of 15 minutes, and it moved slowly over the days. So eventually it would get to like 3 a.m. when it took 15 minutes, and no one cared then. But then, of course, it would start being back at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then 9 o'clock, and people cared then. And when it failed, because the application kept a connection open to the SOAP service, the TCP connection would sometimes time out, and then they'd get horrible error messages as well. It was not great. And, and the error messages you get in your help desk software was like, did my email send? I sent 4,000 at once. <laughs> no idea. Some of them might have gone out. Some of them might not have done. Not great. And considering the company loved sending emails, yeah, so we decided to rewrite it. And what we did, implement the iEmail connector interface. That was when it was created. And we just released the iEmail interface and the separate implementation that's connected to the SOAP service. So just everything on the top part of this graph. Because trunk-based development, release a small piece, deploy it, and then if something breaks, you know you can just undo it. And then we implemented RabbitMQ and a connector that would do all of the magic that the SOAP service did. It was implemented as many decorators, so each one was testable, which meant we could figure out what the SOAP service did because it also had some queuing technology in it, which didn't queue at all. I the idea was that if it had more than 10 emails in its queue, it would pulse them, no, more than 100, it would pulse them in blocks of 10 to exchange. But what it actually did was say, if there was more than 100, wait 10 seconds, then send them all at once. I <laughs> and yeah, there were no tests of any sort, so maybe someone thought it worked. So we got rid of all of that because, you know, a RabbitMQ queue, you can just push stuff onto it and we have a worker process pulling things off and sending it to Exchange. It means we can lie to the user of the application. The second their message hits the RabbitMQ queue, we just say, yeah, your email was sent. The fact that it might be sent a bit later by a worker doesn't really matter. And also, if Exchange decides to spend 30 seconds sending an email, the user still gets the instant response. Usually, if they're on the phone to someone, it doesn't matter because it'll come through within 30 seconds and you, know, you can just blame that on how slow email is sometimes. 
So we implemented a feature toggle for this. Toggle off, get the old version. Toggle on, get the new version. And to test this, because of all of the magic the SOAP service did, which involved like rewriting and formatting emails, we needed to make sure everything went very smoothly. These go out to a lot of people. So we went round our, our company, and this is a very small version of the company, because like I said, we had about 500 people. And we found the one user <coughs> who had the most problems with this system. I phoned him up and said, hey, do you like to beta test our new version? We think it's much better. It seems to work, but we'd quite like you to verify it. And he was all for this, because, you know, the old system was causing him so much pain. Anything that might be slightly better, probably good. So we switched on the toggle for him, and he tested it, found a bunch of problems with it, switched off the toggle, fixed the problems, deploy a new version, and repeat for a couple of weeks. Towards the end of these couple of weeks, hardly not, hardly ever needing to change the toggle state. Once he was happy with it, we went to the next person who had lots of problems, who happened to be his teammate. Now, I don't know if that's related or not. Maybe it was just how they were working. And he didn't find any problems. So we rolled it out to the whole team. And now we found a performance problem. <coughs> the problem was that if you had two users, so blue is user one and green is user two in this case, and blue queues up a thousand emails to send in one queue. And then you're on the phone with the person and go, hey, yeah, I've sent you an email with your contract in it. And the client has not received it. Where is it? A minute later, still hasn't received it. Because there's a thousand emails and exchanges deciding to take 30 seconds to send a thousand, to send one email for a thousand. So that's not great. And we solved that by just implementing two queues. And the worker processes are just set to read from the direct queue when they can. And if there's nothing in the direct queue, pull stuff off the bulk queue. So we implemented that and rolled it out. And they no longer have problems. So we rolled it out to the next department and the next and the next. This whole rollout took about six to eight weeks. And we obviously deleted the toggle at the end. And our rollout went faster and faster and faster. Because as we got more users on it, we could validate that we weren't having more performance problems and thus roll it out to even more users. After we had the whole company using this, we waited another three or four weeks before deleting the toggle because maybe someone would not suddenly notice something and we'd need to undo something temporarily. But it meant our toggle only lived for a total of 10 weeks and we were all very aware of it. Now, with a toggle lying around, you're doubling the number of code paths that there are. In this case, RabbitMQ or Rubbish Soap Service. So quite often people come back, because I've got a toggle, you're making testing harder. I don't, I don't think it does make testing harder. There's a talk by Greg Young um, where he talks about changing a feature. And he says that all tests are immutable. If you change a feature and the need to change tests, what you've done is you've actually created a new set of tests to test a new feature. The old tests didn't change, you just deleted them. This might be down to his love of event, event sourcing. But given that you're going to add a feature toggle, let's say you have a single file with your old version of your tests and you want to add a feature toggle. Create a second file, which is now the toggle on tests. And now you've covered what should happen when the toggle is off check you haven't broken existing functionality and what should happen when the toggle's on test your new functionality sure this has doubled your number of tests but as each unit test should take like 0.1 of a second to run anyway you're not really that added that much time to it and of course your feature toggles are nice and short-lived so you can just delete one of these files at the end of the experiment the experiment went well delete the blue one because it's your old stuff experiment went poorly, delete the green one. And like I said, everyone loves deleting code. So that's more stuff you can delete. If you're looking at manual, say, acceptance testing and someone following a script, it's basically the same thing. They just have two scripts. One is behavior with toggle on, behavior with toggle off. Run through them both. Throw away script when you 
deploy a new version. Now if you're doubling your number of tests, the next uh, piece of feedback I hear a lot is you're adding complexity. But we're software developers. I assume. I mean, everything we do adds complexity of some form. Maybe you're writing an abstraction for something. I mean, sure, that looks like you're reducing complexity, but what you're doing is moving the complexity and hiding it a bit. I don't think it's possible to completely remove complexity, but you can make things nicer to use. So, I would say feature toggles can add complexity, but hopefully only a little bit. And they can help reduce complexity as well. So it's time for another horror story. So this is a company that I used to work for. We had a master branch. In fact, the same company with the feature toggles uh, for, for the rollout. And we had a monolithic application, and bug fixes happened directly against master and were released quite often. And then we had two very large internal projects. By very large, I mean one developer each, because there were only two developers. And they lasted for about a year each. In fact, one of them was still going when I left. There was also an outsource branch with an outsource company that had read one of those Teach Yourself C Sharp in 21 Minutes books and had no idea what source control was, hence why there's only two commits, one at the beginning and one at the end. Um, when I gave this talk last, one of the developers I used to work for uh, saw the video of it and uh, said that the branch still existed and it was now like 4,000 commits behind master. And uh, if anyone was ever being annoying to him, he would threaten them with the rebase of the branch. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's still going. I don't need the outsource branch for this graph, by the way. It's just a hilarious story to add. So yeah, don't have long-lived branches, because pain. Now, the external branch was always out of date. And the internal branches we used to rebase quite often, because we wanted to keep all the bug fixes in them. And the problem occurred when the business said, we're ready for the second internal project to be deployed. So we merged it into master and deployed it. And some bug fix came in. And after a week or so of business testing, we rebased the other internal feature on top of master. Can you see where this is going? Business changed their mind. We don't want internal feature two to go out. We want internal feature one to go out instead. Have you ever tried undoing a rebase? It's not the most straightforward of tasks. And then do this several times for both branches in both directions. Thankfully, not including the outsource branch, because otherwise we might as well have just deleted everything. We learned from this fairly quickly that let's not rebase the branches until the thing is actually in production and not going to be undone from production, because that happened once as well. So don't rebase for a while, because we're just going to cause more work for ourselves. Now, bear in mind, this was the same company that did the beautiful phase rollout of the email connector. And this happened after the email connector. So essentially, it is my fault for not using feature toggles. I don't know why I didn't. Maybe it's stress. Maybe there was too much products. Maybe I just wasn't thinking. If we'd used feature toggles, we could have avoided this whole thing. Sure, we'd have had two very long-lived toggles but we'd have been able to adhere to the businesses, no, we want one, no, we want the other, now we want one, now we want the other, now we want both, but not either of them. We'd have been able to manage this without rebase and merge pain. And maybe those projects would have finished quicker. Maybe not, I don't know. But we could have reduced the complexity and operational overhead we had of dealing with this. But we didn't. And the outsource branch just continued bumbling on in the background. So we've got five rules for feature toggles. Never reuse them. Have a very short lifespan on them, unless it's an operations toggle. Name them so that you can actually tell what they do. Doesn't give you an excuse for bad architecture. What you're doing really does matter. Think it through and please monitor them so you can tell when you can delete them, if they're being used, whether they're useful, or whether your experiment's successful or not. So I think I've got some time for questions, and some links here. The first one is 
the uh, Knight's Capital failure. There is a book about it as well. If you've got some time, I re really recommend reading the book. Um, the second link is HP's um, transformation, and that's a DevOps transformation as well. And that also has a book and is very good. And then we've got some information about Martin Fowler, um, about feature toggles, and the last one is the link to this slide deck. If you view it online, hit the letter S on your keyboard and you'll get my speaker notes. So yeah, that's all I had. And any questions? Before the roof falls in. Hi, I've got a question. Uh, do you use any kind of service for uh, keeping the configuration for feature toggles? Um, not always. In my current company, we don't. We just, uh, who has heard of Octopus Deploy? A uh, few people. So Octopus Deploy is a deployment solution for .NET projects, which you build up your single artifact and then it copies that artifact into the right environment and configures it for each environment. And we tend to put any feature toggles we use as just configuration variables into that, because effectively that means we're doing startup toggles. And we don't use them very heavily at my current company. The previous company, the toggles were actually stored in a service we wrote ourselves because it was tied into Active Directory. So that's how we rolled it out to the different groups. We just said, if the user is in this Active Directory group, then the toggle is on for them. So, no, we didn't use a third-party service. If I was going to use a third-party one, I'd probably use LaunchDarkly, um, especially as they've got a lot of thing about how you can use the toggles, but also still obey GDPR and not give them information that you don't want to. It's all done client-side instead. It's very clever. And I've been writing a feature toggling uh, service myself from scratch because it's fun. Don't use that, though. <laughs> okay, I see the next one. Hey, Hi. I really like your presentation. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a situation where I had a feature toggle and I have twice as many tests, yeah? Yes. So if I had another uh, experiment in the similar area of the system, suddenly I have four tests, yes. four sets of tests to maintain. Next experiment means eight. So should I just uh, avoid having multiple experiments in the same part or is there a way around it? Kind of. So depending on what you're actually writing, you'd either have them, hopefully experiments running in separate places, or maybe not all of the tests would need to change. So if you had a, if you had, let's say, tests on integration for a web page, you might just have one test file that deals with, say, the buy it now area. So you could only have to duplicate that small area. So I, I guess if you have a lot of experiments going on at once, it might be that you need to, to factor out some smaller components. If you're doing trunk-based development, do the factoring out and just deploy that then come back and add tests for the new version with the new functionality as well. So the small deployable units will help you not break things. Or if you do break them, undo it fairly quickly. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, would you share some insights, please, on how to reliably and not resource intensively check for feature to do, to do changes? So if you want to avoid like heavy usage of, of feature toggles, um, the periodic checking where it, it does the, the fetching of the toggle states in the background is a good idea. <coughs> uh, to use LaunchDarkly as an example, their client library will do this in the background for you. So when you check a feature toggle state, you're actually just checking a, an in-memory store of, of what the data is rather than having to round trip to a server in the cloud, someone else's computer, that kind of thing. Um, startup toggles, you tend to be writing them into environment settings or into your app config settings. So again, they're only being read once, so it's not very heavy usage. But if you wanted to check the state of a toggle on every page load, then you definitely want to be using some background fetching because you obviously don't want to have to round trip a server every time someone refreshes a web page. Oh. Right, thanks. Uh, 
I see no more questions. So I guess if you want to ask Andy about anything else, you can catch him yep. after the, uh, the talk. Now let's uh, thank you, Andy, for his talk. Yep.